Now, if you ever worked with electronics, you probably know what this guy is. It's an inertial measurement unit. On board, we have a gyroscope, an accelerometer, and a compass. And using this, we can find our location in the world, our rotation, our heading, and if we coupled it with the GPS, our position and altitude. It's what lets a robot know its surroundings. It's kind of like the eyes and the ears of your circuit. Now, inside these little black squares are microelectromechanical devices. They're great in measuring the world accurately, cheaply, and most important, quickly. And while they work well for most applications, say smartphones and robotics measurements, they're crap. What you really want are these guys. Physical sensors. This here is an accelerometer. It's sensitive to plus minus 10 G's with 0 0.02 millig resolution. Ridiculously sensitive. This guy here is a gyroscope. It's a rate gyroscope built in 1961 by Honeywell. Inside is a motor, a differential transformer, which itself is part of the motor, some coils, some oil, and some really fancy micro-machining, which originally cost $15,000 in today's money. Now, while most people don't have $15,000 to blow on a gyroscope, these things show up on eBay for about 30 bucks a piece if you're lucky, and are great if you want to do any real measurement, or, in the case of me, build an analog robot. Like the accelerometer, this guy is extremely sensitive. He is capable of measuring 0 0.01 degrees per second with a maximum drift of plus minus 0 0.1 degrees per second. It's kind of ridiculous. If you hear closely, there's a little motor spinning inside. Now you can't just throw 5 volts onto this and make it work though. You have to build supporting circuitry for it. In fact, this much supporting circuitry. While it's not a trivial task, it's also not impossible. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to make a gyroscope like this work. So let's get to it. Naturally, this gyroscope has to spin at some ridiculous speeds in order for it to work efficiently. So as such, we have a brushless motor inside. The brushless motor is actually a split phase induction motor, which in its essence is merely a stator along with one winding here and another winding here. And they are arranged in such a way that if you put a sine wave into this and a 90 degrees phase shifted sine wave into this or a cosine wave, you end up making a rotating magnetic field which spins the stator. To generate that, I have here a quadrature oscillator. It's an op amp coupled to another op amp and they are both integrators. An instability, some random instability, which is generated when the circuit is powered up, is both oh, I dropped something. Is both amplified and integrated by the first op amp. And in essence, we generate a sine wave. Afterward, this sine wave is fed into a second op amp, which integrates it again. And a second sine wave is generated, one that is phase shifted 90 degrees, and we make a cosine wave. That's fed back into the input of this op amp to keep the oscillation going. And three resistors are chosen such that the oscillator oscillates at the correct frequency as well as oscillates at all and remains stable. R1 is usually a bit smaller than these two resistors. Now the angular frequency, which is in itself equal to 2 pi f, is going to be RC value of this circuit, the time constant, or actually 1 over RC. Where C is this capacitor, as well as this capacitor, and this resistor, as well as this resistor. They do not add up, actually. Say if your C value is this and your R value is this, having the same C and R value over here is not going to change the frequency as you would expect. These do not add up. This is the RC value circuit that we're, or this is the RC circuit that we are going to derive all of our frequency equations from. Now, being op amps, these things do amplify. So if we look at test point one, we would expect a small sine wave, like this one. But test point two is going to be larger because small sine waves get amplified to, into bigger sine waves. And if we're trying to drive a motor, that's typically not good. We want both of our windings to have the same amplitude. 
So what we have to do then is send the first minuscule sine wave through a variable resistor and then through another op amp, one which is not configured to be inverting. By adjusting this variable resistor, we can end up setting the gain of the op amp. And after all is said and done, we can generate two sine waves which are both the same frequency, or more specifically, one sine wave and one cosine wave. Since op amps don't supply enough current to run a motor typically, we have to put these signals into AB amplifiers. In this case, just a 2N3906 and a 2N3904 transistor stacked on top of each other, along with some diodes to separate the base voltage a little bit. And then we are able to drive our motor. We have to have two AB amplifiers, actually. One for our sine wave and one for our cosine wave. And then they are bypassed by some large capacitors. Because large capacitors are only coming in an electrolytic form, we have to put two in series with their polarities opposite each other to make a non-polar capacitor. Now by sending these two waves into our motor, we should set up a rotating magnetic field which will cause our gyroscope to spin. Unfortunately, I do not know how many poles our stator has because this gyroscope lacks any data being made in 1960. So, I cannot tell how fast this motor is going to spin. In essence, this gyroscope is a differential transformer. We put a sine wave into the exciter coil, and then out of the secondary coils, which are arranged in such a way that they are out of phase and normally cancel each other out, we will get something which is going to be proportional to omega, or our angular velocity of the gyroscope. Now normally, this core is arranged in such a manner that this and this perfectly cancel each other out, and we will get nothing. But, because this core is rotating at a very high speed, it's going to have an angular inertia, and it's not going to want to change its plane. So what happens inside the gyroscope is, this is on a pivot. And then as the body of the gyroscope turns, the motor's core remains in the same plane, and these two coils end up no longer canceling each other out, and rather we are going to get something which could be, say, a high amplitude wave, or a low amplitude wave, or perhaps a high amplitude, low frequency phase shifted wave. In the case of this gyroscope, we end up getting a wave which is going to be both amplitude modulated and phase modulated based on the direction of rotation of the gyroscope. And that's useful to us. It gives us two pieces of data. But in order to make it useful to us, we have to generate the initial sine wave. And the initial sine wave have to be, it has to be a very good sine wave. Otherwise, we're going to lose any hope of accuracy that we wanted to get from this gyroscope. So I chose one kilohertz. As far as generating that one kilohertz signal goes, it's not it's not a very straightforward process. Rather, what I have to do is take a crystal oscillator, this one at 4.096 megahertz, and, well, do a Schmidt trigger on it, and send it through an inverter. The inverter divides this 4.096 megahertz signal by two, 12 times. In the end, I get something which is close to one kilohertz and is not going to change or drift with, with temperature or voltage or any other sort of nonsensical changing values which would ruin my measurement. But we're going to get a square wave and this square wave is going to look something like this. Or rather, it's going to look something like this where the square wave is biased above ground and is oscillating at one kilohertz. Just ignore that. But we want something like this, because we're using amplifiers. We want it to oscillate between plus some voltage and minus some voltage, but centered about zero volts. So to do that, we have to send it through a bypass capacitor. And this bypass capacitor is going to do something which would reduce our voltage offset by the average of the two voltage offsets and center our wave about zero. But then we want to amplify it and we want to clean it up a little bit, so we're going to send it through an amplifier to do that. We will get, in essence, another square wave, a bigger one, and one that is a bit cleaner. 
But square waves are bad. If we send a square wave into a coil, we're going to make a mess of things. It's going to turn into something, I don't know, probably looks like this. Uh, yes, it goes back in time. So we don't want that. We have to integrate our square wave, and we're going to do that with an integrating amp. And the integrating amp is going to take our curve with no slope and add a slope to it, and we end up getting a triangle wave. This triangle wave is going to be closer to a sine wave, but still not quite what we need. So once more, we have to integrate the triangle wave, and then when we integrate something that has a slope, we're going to end up with something which is a curve. Now it's not a perfect curve, it's not a real sine wave, so to speak, but something like x to the third repeating. But nonetheless, it is good enough for what we need it for. And so, we amplify it again, and then we send it through an instrumentation amplifier over here. Now this instrumentation amplifier is going to give us a nice sine wave that's referenced about zero volts and equal in amplitude on both sides. That's useful to us because that's a signal that is great for our gyroscope, but it's not powerful enough, so again, we have to send it through a class AB amplifier two transistors with diodes, but biased just enough that all of the commutation from these transistors is cancelled out into what looks like a very nice sine wave over here. That is sent through some bypass capacitors and off into the exciting coil in our gyroscope. Now we need some further circuitry to make this useful for us. What we have out of the gyroscope is a phase shifted sine wave. And if we reference this to the sine wave which we made earlier, we can see that this sine wave does indeed represent angular velocity and rotational direction, which is useful, but not useful enough. You see, analyzing two waves each time if we want to get our velocity is not the best way to go about things. So what we have to do is turn this into a signal which is easy to analyze and useful in the sense that it can be put into any circuit that requires a voltage reference based on the angular velocity of something. So we take our two signals and we amplify them. We put them through conditioning amplifiers. Now you would think that we could only get away with amplifying the gyroscope signal. And to a certain extent that's true. But if you put the gyroscope signal through an amplifier, you're going to get a phase shift. And that phase shift is going to cause a DC error in your voltage. So that's bad. What we have to do is amplify both of the signals, and there's really no way to get around that unless you want to get creative with LC networks. But nobody wants to do that. That's not particularly the best way to go. So we amplify both of the signals, and we adjust their reference voltages so that they're both above ground and useful to us. Because what were we going to do with them? Well, we have to subtract them. If we subtract the larger signal from the smaller, we will end up getting one sine wave which is representative of our angular velocity and our direction solely by its amplitude. And if we have a sine wave which grows bigger and smaller based on the gyroscope's position, or not position, but based on the gyroscope's velocity and direction, and that's much easier to work with than two signals. So, we put them into a difference amplifier. It's just an op amp. It has a gain setting over here, a reference setting over here, and the two inputs, and the differential inputs end up subtracting each other, and we get one signal just like the one we were looking for. But even then, this is not particularly helpful to us. Now we have a sine wave whose amplitude is based on the direction and the velocity, but we want something easier to analyze still. So what we have to do is put it into a peak detection network. 
to find the amplitude of the sine wave. Now, now finding the amplitude of a sine wave isn't a hard thing to do. Simply put, we can just put the sine wave through a diode, which will rectify our sine wave. And if we put this into a capacitor in such a way, then the capacitor will build up a voltage which is equal to the peak voltage of the signal applied. Almost. This diode has a voltage drop nominally 0.7 volts. So that means the voltage on here is going to be 0.7 volts lower than it should be, which is bad. We're losing information. So what we have to do is send it through a compensation amplifier. An op amp with negative feedback does the best that it can to make sure that the voltage between the positive input and the inverting input are equal. So if we put a signal into here, we're going to get a signal out that's going to be equal in amplitude. It's going to go through the diode, and it's going to charge up the capacitor. But, because the capacitor's plate is going to be hooked up to the inverting input, we're going to get a discrepancy. In fact, we'll get a one diode voltage drop discrepancy. The amplifier doesn't like that. So what it does is it boosts the voltage just enough to overcome the diode's voltage drop and we get a signal here which is going to be equal in amplitude to the maximum amplitude of the signal applied. We have a resistor over here which is going to drain the capacitor over time so our peak detection is not just going to take a peak and hold it forever. That wouldn't be useful to us either. Now what we get is a signal that is reminiscent of our first sine wave's amplitude with these little bumps. You can see where the capacitor discharges here and where it's recharged again by the peak of the sine wave. By increasing the value of C or increasing the value of R, we can make this go away. But then our amplifier network becomes too sluggish. We end up having a C which discharges way too slowly to be helpful for us. So it's a trade-off between the bumps and the no bumps. But that's going to be above ground because, well, we detected the peak and the peak is above ground. Because we're going to work with differential amplifiers in the future, we want this centered about ground. So what we're going to do is simply put it into an amplifier and then use the reference voltage of the amplifier or the offset nulling to push it down a little bit until it's centered about ground. We can't just use a capacitor because if we use a capacitor we're going to lose all of our information because our information is now DC instead of AC carried. So the amplifier is just going to push it down just enough that we end up getting a signal that is centered about zero yet carries all the information from the gyroscope in a way that we can use and analyze in our further networks. In this case the angular velocity and the direction. Rotation in the positive direction should make our gyroscope voltage go one way and rotation in the negative direction should make it go the other way. And it does. And that's all there really is to the gyroscope network. We have three boards and these three boards do three different things. I'm not counting the power supply because counting the power supply would be cheating. <laughs> 